Okay, uh, welcome to Fishing with Superbait. Uh, my name is uh, Jeremiah Grossman. I am the CTO of a company called White Hat Security. Uh, this will be a different presentation. Uh, I've only done this presentation one other time, so uh, it should be pretty uh, interesting. Normally, I do uh, what I wanted to do with this presentation was uh, to have two computers, run, one running on each projector, so we could see one computer controlling the other. But uh, we'll be able to do it with one. It'll just look a little uh, haphazard. So uh, a little bit about myself. Um, this is about my 10th time speaking at Black Hat, and uh, this is actually one of my favorite conferences to go to because we get to talk about you know, really high-end things going on in the industry. It's an opportunity to share what the leading or bleeding edge is in information security, some of the, the high-end attacks and uh, some of the really complicated stuff like the one before, the one before us. Um, what I do in my uh, daily life is I do technology R&D for web application security and different solutions. Um, I'm a frequent, frequent Black Hat speaker. Um, and uh, also Black Hat and lots of other conferences speak for NASA and ISSA and lots of conferences like that. Uh, my night job, which keeps me busy uh, even when I'm at work, is uh, founding of the Web Application Security Consortium. Uh, it is a body uh, devoted to web application security and pushing the industry forward with standards and with, uh, with cooperation amongst everybody in web application security from the vendors to the users, developers, and so forth. And uh, previously to uh, founding White Hat, I was an information security officer at Yahoo, where I was the so-called hacker Yahoo for about two years. And my eminent domain there was uh, 600 or so websites in 42 countries and about 180 million users. And uh, learning about that environment, what web applications really means as a whole in, you know, when you really get out there. Uh, a little bit about my company. We do remote scanning of websites. We schedule scans and run continuous scans on websites, publicly available websites. We find the vulns and relay the information to customers. So all I do all day is hack websites and tell customers how to fix it. That's what we do. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about, uh, of course, fishing with Superbait and what exactly does that mean or what do I mean by it. We're going to cover current web security models, uh, phishing and cross-site scripting, some hybrid attacks, some of the very, very high-end cross-site scripting attacks uh, and also best practices. Uh, for in your books, there's a lot more slides than what we will be presenting up here. Um, we'll do the demos, which will cover most of the material, uh, the slides that I took out. And uh, so we'll lay the groundwork on the current security models. A lot of you might know this material, but it's good to understand the, the basic models, what they do, what they don't do, and because we'll be circumventing them all, everything from SSL to the same origin policy, and, uh, and so forth. So what do we have out there um, as far as web security goes? What are we, the users, how are we protected? Well, the, uh, the current marketing jargon out there says SSL secures everything. We can shop at the websites because they have SSL on the website secure. Um, we have browser security to some extent. We'll go into the same origin policy and some other things. And we also have the uh, on the horizon but not yet implemented and uh, you know, already controversial two-factor authentication that's coming to the web. So just to blast through a couple of these slides on what SSL is and what it does and what it does not do. Um, first and foremost, uh, SSL encrypts the traffic between point A and point B. But SSL does not, contrary to what the websites tell you, SSL does not make a website secure. If a website has a vulnerability in it, the data is not protected. Simple as that. Okay, you know, probably preaching to the choir here, but SSL really does not make a website secure. It only secures the data in transit. SSL sites have been hacked using SSL just as much as the ones who don't. All right, same origin policy. Now, this is a quoted verbatim from the Mozilla website, and it's a little confusing, but uh, we'll go into what it means. The same origin policy prevents documents or scripts loaded from one origin from getting or setting properties of a document from a different origin. Now, this is a, an interesting historical point because this is actually where the term cross-site came into play, where you know, back in the mid to late 90s, uh, different web developers on rogue websites out there, you would land on a particular website and they would load up frames uh, to other places and have JavaScript read into those other frames, hence the cross-domain. And they implemented the same origin policy soon after. So if the site was being delivered from domain one, 
it couldn't access data from domain two. So this is a uh, brief example here. So this page here, this blue box, has some uh, code in it, and it's being delivered in the white up there at top, on the top of the box under the domain one.com context. The source in the uh, actual page itself is loading up two additional iframes, one to domain one and the other to domain two. J below it in the, uh, the variable, in the JavaScript, there is the x1 and x2 variables. Now what happens is, is when the first one's loaded, when that's, it gets executed, it will reference the domain one uh, site, the domain one iframe, and that's okay because they're on the same domain. But what happens is, is when the second code where it goes by iframe two and tries to reference it outside the domain context, it gets denied. And if you're familiar with the console messages in Firefox, this is the message you'll get, you'll get a permission denied. So that's the same origin policy in action, preventing script in one domain from accessing data in the other domains to protect cookies and data from other sites. So we have that. Then we have two-factor authentication, and uh, we have online banks uh, rolling it out or saying they're going to roll it out. Even AOL says they're going to roll it out. And uh, you know, it's you know, my contention that many, uh, my prediction, many others will be trying it out or trying to force it upon us to use these types of two-factor auth, thinking that they're the, uh, you know, the solution to all our problems. But uh, I'm here to tell them that they are not. Um, so Bruce Schneier has already uh, spoken a little bit about two-factor auth and uh, that this solution is not, it will not solve the problems we have today. He says two-factor authentication isn't our savior. It won't defend us against phishing. It's not going to prevent identity theft. It's not going to secure online accounts from fraudulent transactions. It solves the security problems we had 10 years ago and this, not the security problems we have today. So that's his words. So I'll go into a little bit more about why that is a little bit later with the demos. So laying more groundwork, what is the phishing scam? So this is the traditional. We see this a million times a day in our inboxes. The phishing scam is really just the high-tech version of the age-old confidence scam where you know, somebody approaches me on the street, tries to convince me there's somebody that they're not, and proceeds to try and con me. That's really all it is. So when we have the normal phishing scam, it works you know, something like this. We're familiar with it. We get a, an email. And in the email, we have says, you know, dear eBay user or eBay member or something like that. And might even have some kind of security policy saying a quarter of my site policy, blah, 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 do something and click here. And they're taken to a page that says, please fill out this form that might have your PIN number, username, and password. But the, the, it's different from the real site. The domain will actually be different. They'll use IPs or some kind of URL masquerading. They'll use lookalike domains, but it's not the real website. Now, it's important to remember is that phishing attacks traditionally don't occur on the real website. Okay, so that's how we're able to spot them. That's how we're able to detect them is that they're not on the real domain. It's not the real website. It's merely a clone. So after the users filled in their data, it shifts off to the attacker, credit card data, social security numbers, usernames, passwords, and they profit. So that's the uh, normal phishing scam. All right, so how do else we get, get uh, you know, how users get taken in by phishing scams? Well, they get, uh, you know, of course, the email, the instant, message, instant messages, message board postings, guest books, blogs. There's lots and lots of ways, uh, you know, the criminals are able to communicate to us and try to get us to do something or visit a web page with some nefarious content or from, you know, cloned content. So some quick stats, some quick trends out there from the anti-phishing working group. Number of phishing attacks reported is over 2,500 now as of January 2005. It's growing at 28% between uh, July, July and January. That's 2004. The number of brands hijacked by phishing, 64. Uh, the average time for an online, for uh, the, the, the site that's online, the cloned website or the, uh, the phishing website is 5.8 days. And the longest one they've seen is over a month. So there's some basic stats on what's going on out there and that the problem is growing because it seems to be effective. All right, so we seen we know phishing. We've seen uh, some of the browser security models and a lot of us have seen, well, all of us have probably seen uh, cross-site scripting at least referenced somewhere. Uh, we see it on bug track daily, many, many times. 
and uh, to the point where a lot of us get nauseous seeing it. But it is dangerous. It is, mis it is underestimated as far as its power goes. But JavaScript is really what makes cross-site scripting bad. It's a, become a very, very powerful language. If you've seen uh, Google Maps or, Google, uh, or Gmail, you know the power of JavaScript. It can do lots and lots of things, both for good and for bad. Uh, Cross-site scripting itself is by far the most common vulnerability that we see out there today. When we do assessments on websites, cross-site scripting is easily number one. It'll appear on 90% or more of the websites out there, and usually not just one. It'll, ha it'll occur in multiple instances. So it is also, it's a little small, I apologize, but the cross-site scripting is also part of the OS top 10. It's part of the web security threat classification. If you don't know about it, learn about it. There's plenty of resources all over the place, but, cross, but I'll explain how cross-site scripting works and, how it, uh, and what it's capable of. So when cross-site scripting uh, executes, what JavaScript itself, even if you take the exploit out of it, you just talk about JavaScript, JavaScript has complete access to the document object model. What that is is you know, when you look at a web page, it has complete access to all the text, all the images, all the forms, all your cookies. It has access to everything as, as part of the, uh, what you're looking at in the browser. You can, using JavaScript, you can alter the content or cross-site scripting. You can alter the content of news articles, change the actions of forms and where they point to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Lots and lots of stuff, and we'll get into some demos. And for users, when you've been cross-site scripted, it's very, very difficult to, uh, to detect that you've actually had it because a, a cleverly written uh, cross-site scripting attack is not going to leave any traces. It's, it's, it's more or less invisible. So there's two types of cross-site scripting. There's type one, um, direct echo is one of the many names for it. It's the most common variety of cross-site scripting. The thing about this one is it requires the victim to click on a link to be exploited. So you might get an email or somebody might ask you to click on a link, but to be, get, to be affected by this one, you must click, which makes it the, the less, lesser of the two, less severe of the two. When they click, the JavaScript code executes. So at a basic level, this is how it works, so, or how a, a scenario might work. An attacker sends an email to a, uh, to a user containing an email with a specially crafted link. That link has a host name of the victim's website in the domain. Okay, so let's just, uh, we'll pick on eBay for the time being. So it'll have an eBay host name, and it will have a bunch of JavaScript code uh, tacked onto the end of it. But a user looks at it and goes, looks like it's from eBay, has a domain, it's eBay, probably is eBay, let's click on it. So what happens is, is the code in the URL there, the one highlighted in red, it gets sent to the server and gets echoed back as part of the page content, okay? It now becomes part of the page and executes in the domain of, well, in this case, victim.com, or if we want to pick on eBay and continue to do so. So the JavaScript code executes. Now, the script can do lots of things, and the most, uh, the most notorious one that we see uh, cross-site scripting, at least examples of it, is uh, a cookie theft. So the the document.cookie is an object that'll give you the cookie string. And what the, uh, what the exploit will do is send an off-domain request, usually an image, and tack the cookie data onto an off-domain image request. So you beat the same origin policy in that way. Okay, so you take the cookie data, you put it onto the end of an off-domain request, and off you go. You get all the data that you want. And in the logs, on the hacker's logs, what he'll see is, uh, the, the, his log entries, you know, makeshift uh, web server logs, and the cookie data tacked onto a, uh, a get request in his web server log. So now he has the cookie data. So all he had to do is create this link, get a user to click, and he gets the cookies. What does that mean? Well, if the user is logged into that system, he can then reuse the cookies and become them. Okay? Pretty simple, straightforward. So here's the second variety. Uh, HTML injection. This is the one that does not require users to click. It just auto-executes, and here's how it no a lot of times it will work. Um, we'll pick on Yahoo Mail, for instance, but this will happen on message boards, uh, guest books. Any place where user-submitted content becomes part of the actual page content, hosting user-supplied data, this becomes a problem. So the, in this case, the the hacker would send HTML email to a Yahoo user, a Yahoo Mail user, laced with JavaScript code of some kind, and when they read the email, it will execute inside the browser. Inside the browser. So, and the same attack occurs. It will grab the cookie, put it onto the end of an image, uh, a, a new image DOM object, and 
off it goes to the uh, to the hacker where they can pick it up and reuse it. So it's the same attack, but it, it but the requirements for execution are less. So this is the uh, the real dangerous cross-site scripting vulnerability out there. So what can we use all this stuff to? And I'll, I'll keep promising the demos, but they'll come. So we can steal cookies, hijack sessions, uh, execute unintended functionality on the website. We can harass users with malicious code, alter any portion of the web page, deface or DOS the website, or violate the same origin policy, or aid in phishing. So what have we seen out there? So phishers right now are just using the, the garden variety simple uh, phishing attacks. But what we have seen them start doing with eBay or SunTrust Bank or some of these other examples here is that they're starting to use cross-site scripting, a website vulnerability, to leverage their attacks and make them to seem more real. So the, uh, the genie is out of the bottle, so to speak, that the attackers are using this because the, the scam looks more effective. You're not, they're not clicking and going to a cloned website. They're staying on the same website, which makes it that much harder to detect. So here's the two varieties of what we're seeing those particular uh, hacks work. They're doing uh, two types, the cross-site scripting redirect disguise, and I'll explain it, and also page rewriting. So let me go into the redirect. Uh, so this is a, a quick uh, little uh, excerpt here from a report by the Anti-Fishing Working Group. Said so they have been seeing these types of attacks. So let me read it here. During the month of January, WebSense Security saw a number of attacks using cross-site scripting to redirect URLs from popular websites in order to better present themselves as a means to prevent blocking. An example of this attack was, to, was discovered utilizing the Lyco search engine. By crafting a URL, the, the hacker can redirect any end user through Lyco's directory to a fraudulent web page. And it, here's an example below. And the URL in there, it is a lycos.com domain. It is legitimate. But on the end, you see WebSense Security Labs on the end. So what happens is, and I'll show it to you. The user gets sent a link with the right domain, the one they're expecting, and on the end of it, there's a, a, a domain that the hacker wa will have them redirect it to. So what happens is when you click on this link, it goes to the server, and the first circle is see the request go out, and the second red circle is the redirect that they're going to. So in this case, they'll be redirected to B of A in this case, but they can redirect them to wherever they want. So. The initial link looks real, but they'll land on a fake web page in a fake domain. So this is the, uh, the Achilles heel of this attack. It just makes it a little bit more real. So we are seeing this happen out there, but it is getting a bit more real. If any time I'm like, talking way too fast, raise your hands and ask questions and stuff. It helps you slow down. <laughs> Anybody have any questions so far? All right. So page rewriting. Here's the second one. We're not redirecting them anymore, and uh, I'll be demoing this. Uh, right up in the slide, actually. So this is the more convincing one. This is, uses the cross-site scripting type one, which rewrites the page. So they click on the link, the code gets loaded into the, uh, into the DOM environment, and let's say for the uh, sake of argument, it will update the form where form's supposed to. So let's say, imagine a login page where you, somebody emails them a link from PayPal security is say, you know, please reset your password on the system. Send you a link, they click the link, and the link redirects where that form posts to, to wherever they are. Okay? And I'll show you an example of this. Okay, you have to give me a second here. be a little bigger on the screen. But uh, OK, so this is, uh, I set up a, a blog software on, uh, on my laptop here. This is why I was supposed to run on two machines. But I set up a, a real simple blog software here. It has uh, three entries. And this is the, the actual victims, the victim website, the one we're going to be cloning. OK? Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to log into the management end. And good, I'm already logged in. OK, so this is the management portion of the, blo of the uh, blog. We can add new entries, you know, make new entries. We have all the, the back end functionality here. So let me pull up some code.
this is always the uh, dangerous part of doing live demos and presentations. You know, nobody uh, can't help myself, but Mr. Murphy has my number, believe me. <laughs> All right. All right, so here is a, one of the admin screens. And one of these parameters up here is vulnerable to cross-site scripting, meaning you can put data in here and, uh, and it'll echo back to the screen and unfilter for uh, HTML tags as what uh, good security would indicate. So let me pull out and find where the vulnerability is because I cheated. It's in the type parameter, and I'll show you how this works. So we'll put in, how about a little U tag first, so something we'll underline. Can everybody see this somewhat okay? Okay. And we'll hit enter and see what happens. All right. Nothing happened. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry? Oh, it's the wrong parameter? Type. Oh, I went, oh, type. Good. That's funny. All right, so we see right here, see this uh, little indicator here? A lot of times we'll use alert to pop up a JavaScript alert, but if we see the test that we entered wrapped by two U tags, that's how we know cross-site scripting happened because uh, the HTML rendered in the page. Now what happens if we uh, do something a little bit more sophisticated, and I have my little cheat sheet here taking advantage of the uh, actual vulnerability. And in the URL here, if you notice, is that I put in a script tag. Now the script tag sources in code from something off of uh, off an off-domain source. It's still on the same box here, but it's running on a different web server, but on port 8,000 rather than 7,000. So we'll see if we'll toss this in and uh, see if it'll work. So what, we're, what this code does, it will actually uh, deface the web page. What we want to do is, so this is a, what I've shown on this page, this is the normal web page. Now, we're going to deface it. Great. The host names aren't working. So it's still going to localhost, but on a different port. So the point is that JavaScript can be sourced in from just about anywhere. OK, why is it not working? <laughs> oh, I know. The code is not correct. I normally have two computers doing this. All right. So. <laughs> Fierce blackout, why not? <laughs> um, so if we, uh, if we look at the uh, host name here, we're still on the, uh, the actual host name, so we'll jump over and we'll go to 127. Dot zero, dot zero, dot one. So this is the actual, uh, web, the actual web page, so this is the host name here with the port. So if we look at the, fish, at the deface website, it's identical. So we've, using cross-site scripting, we've defaced the page for that moment in time. So, so for that user or for that administrator, we have hacked the web page. Okay, we have not altered any files on the web page or you know, performed the defacement in the, in the classical sense by altering files. We have just simply rewritten the entire web page. So that's uh, not too subtle, but it is uh, funny and effective. All right. So what, what if we got a, a, a little bit you know, more sinister? What if uh, we went, let's see, let's try to uh, steal their password, for instance. So I might have to change some code here to go to localhost rather than the other computer. OK. So once again, that was the normal web page. That's the normal URL. OK. Now, we'll put in the, 
the hack again. I'm typing in localhost far too much. All right. So we'll hit enter. Uh, we'll... All right. Now, this is similar to the defacement hack, okay? But we got a login screen. So what this code is, what we pulled in, this is the code here that we pulled in. This rewrites the entire page to make it look like a login screen, okay? It's still on the same website, it's just a new login screen. Now, to the user that thinks, okay, you know, they might have got an email that says update your software or change your password or you know, some, something, anything to convince them. And they'll think, okay, I got to, you know, to do whatever this thing says, I have to type in my username and password. So they go, okay. Now, before I type in my username and password, no, wrong one. This one here. This is the server that's actually, uh, we're tailing the, uh, the access logs to it so you can see what happens. This is the off domain page running on port uh, 8000. So I want to put in my password. I <laughs> can't see it. And hit login. Now, everything worked fine. They're now in the MN console. They saw nothing. Nothing happened. Everything worked fine. But if we go back, uh, where is it? There we go. On the off domain server, OK? In the URL, because we sent it off domain, my username and password is actually in there. Okay, so I'll show you how it worked in the code, what we actually did. So, this is the form. The uh, this all the code here is the form. Okay, that's all the cosmetic things that we did. In the code here, what we've done is the first thing we did is steal username and password. And we grabbed the strings from the username and password field, and we sent it to the steal, uh, steal uh, function. The next thing we did was submitted the form with whatever they sent in. We sent it to the, uh, to the right server. So if we look in the uh, action here, it just sends you know, to localhost here to MT, uh, MTCGI. So if we look at the steal username and password function, what it did was it just used the, uh, the common trick. You make a new image DOM object, and you set its source attribute to something off domain, notice the port 8000 here rather than 7000. You can make it whatever you want as long as you know, they're on, they're the user's online, so you can make it go wherever. And you tack on the username and password. So that gets shipped off domain first, they log in, and everything works beautifully. No, nobody saw a thing, okay? So that's how something more subtle would work. But cross-site scripting really doesn't end there as far as you, know, I'm sorry, go ahead. It would function perfectly. It would. I think, depending on the browser, yeah, you're probably right that if I'm using a, yeah, you're right. I think if I'm using some non-secure content, I wonder what would happen if uh, I use an SSL server as the target. You know, two different. You, you, you might have to play some trickery to get around some of the browser pop-ups, but you just set an off-domain secure server, you might be okay. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, if, you know, the user, you know, something pops up and says something's insecure, they're probably going to click OK anyway. Yeah. 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 So there's so I'm, I'm probably uh, the biggest culprit of that anyway. <laughs> so. All right. All right. So we so. So we, have, uh, so we have the defacement, we have password theft, which is uh, more, more uh, indicative of, uh, of the cross-site scripting, you know, of the phishing scams that want usernames and passwords. So let's go one step further. Let's, uh, let's try something uh, you know, a bit more insidious. Um, we're going to try a, a spoof. So this one here, okay, so I'll probably have to re rewrite this stuff as, per as usual. All right. 
Now this will go real quick, so I'll try to get, get to it real fast. Okay. So down here, if you notice in this iframe here, I might have to change the code to, to update. But this hack here opens up an iframe, okay? It will open it up to a particular URL on the same host, on an on-domain host, okay, to perform some action for me. So let's just reload that. Did it work? Did we uh, did spoof get sucked in? No. Yeah, spoof got sucked in. Okay. So something's going on. Oh, do I? Yeah, ah, very good. Thank you. And <laughs> somebody else debugging my code from. Okay, so I think 127.0.0.1. All right, so let's try this again. 127.0.0.1 pulls it in. Good. Huh. Well, let's check this out real quick. working a second ago, wasn't it? Wasn't this blue before? <laughs> huh. Let's see. Uh, oh, down here, over here? Oh, yes, you might be right, yes. No, it's just a URL. 127.0.0.1. Okay, I think uh, what's happening here is something with the blog that's set up on, set up incorrectly. But this should still work. So it's still setting up, but why is it not connecting? So let me... for the delay. I'm going to grab that. I, I'm just trying to I'm going to pull the source down from the other location to make sure I have it right. So it's going in. Okay. Focal host. It's good. Operator error. All right. <laughs> so maybe that's not working. Dot one. Seven thousand. I apologize. That's just uh, not wanting to work. What that should have done is uh, when you execute that, it will auto post a blog entry. So right when they click on that link, it'll, it would auto post a blog entry to the blog and it has another nice Stallone picture on it. <laughs> but uh, so JavaScript has the, has the ability to perform actions on, uh, on behalf of the user. So it has that power as well. So a couple of quick demos there to show you how, uh, how phishing uh, does, can use a cross that scripting to make itself more believable. So let's jump in back into the slides. We'll have one more demo a little bit later, but uh, let's cover a, a few more things. <laughs> so we have all this stuff. All right, so let's do some, uh, some of the uh, higher end cross site scripting attacks. So this stuff has been experimented out there in the wild by a, 
other people besides myself, uh, case in point Anton Ranger, Anton Ranger, who I've been in contact with, has done some really good work on it. And a lot of the concepts are, are based on it, but not all of them. So I'll be able to demo that here. So what are the current limitations in cross-site scripting that we have? One, the victim attacker connection is not persistent. So once they're cross-site scripted and once they click off, the hacker has no longer has control. So they lose control. And the, off, uh, and the off domain data mechanism, how they transfer is only one way, only from the victim to the attacker. Traditionally, the attacker can't send data on the fly back to the user. Okay, so we're gonna try to solve that particular problem. So the goals of uh, the exploitation of this, given that it works, okay, is that what we want persistent control of the user, excuse me for a second. We want persistent remote control with the browser. We want to keep constant control over the user, even if they click around, okay? We want to be able to monitor several cross-site scripted users all at the same time, and we want to be as invisible as possible, okay? And we want to, you know, as a result, circumvent just about every web security mechanism out there that's, uh, that we have. Uh, bold claim, I know, but uh, it's Black Hat, and uh, if anybody disagrees, question me. All right, so um, I can go into how it works, but I'll, I think I'll just do that after. I'm just gonna go right into the demo and uh, we'll cover exactly how it's working in uh, more detail. So let's just pray that it works. Now, I wanna do a little bit of setup here. Now, so just to reiterate, on port 8000, we have the blog. On port, on port 7000, we have the blog. On port 8000, we're hosting cross-site scripting content. And what I'm gonna do is start, what the heck is this? It won't bind. Huh, probably have to change that code real quick. We're gonna bind something to port 9000. So we have something listening on port 9000. This is our controlling server, and I'll, I'll bring up the controller right now so you can uh, see it. See, all the host names. All right, so this is the controlling server, so you'll be able to see this in action. This is where we're, the cross-site scripted user is gonna send data to, and this is how we'll be able to monitor the user. Now, let's bring up uh, more code. We have the server up. We have this one here. So we're all using the same cross-site scripting vulnerability, just with different code. So let's uh, paste this in here. So I'll hope that it works. Lock or something. <laughs> All right, so let's grab this string. Great. All right, so let's. Where? Where? Oh, did it? Very good. Okay, everything should be functional. Let's hope. I think it worked. Now, what you're seeing here is a cross-site scripted user. Now, I'm gonna try to make this browser screen, I can't. Here we go. Now, if everybody can see the red bar at the top, there's also one on the right and one on the left. This is a visual indicator that they are that the user is trapped in an iframe, okay? What's happened here is, is that when the user got cross-site scripted, the DOM was deleted, okay? I then made a new iframe that's ballooned to the full width of the page and put a red border around itself so we could see it. The location of that iframe was set to whatever the user was expecting to go to, in this case, the admin screen. Now, what I want you to see on the back end here, okay, this is where the off-domain data should be going to, okay? Now, 
I'm going to try to put this off to the side and click this. Now, you see all the, uh, all the hex data? What that is, when the user clicks and jumps, okay, the HTML that they're seeing has been passed off domain in chunks, just how we did all the other stuff. It has passed, passed off domain in chunks. And if you notice the, the polling requests, that's the, that's the cross-site scripted user going, do you want me to do anything, do you want me to do anything, do you want me to do anything, and, uh, and so forth. Now, if we reset the controller, we can see we have trapped a user, they're running a unique session, and we can see what they are seeing, minus the style sheet, okay? Now, we can see what they're seeing. Now, watch. So, right now we have phishing with Superbait on the screen, so remember that one. So, we'll go to, like, uh, entries or something. Okay. Oh, it's still owned. It is in there. See the titles? Now, see? We are watching. So, they're on port 7000. We're on 9 watching them. So, no matter what they do, where they go, we can track them. Now, it would be... Very, very easy to, you know, the, the border is set down below, but we could remove the border and they would never see it. We could constantly track them no matter where they go. So imagine for a moment that we can spawn new iframes that are invisible, okay? So we could try a couple of these. Now, on my local host here, let's see here, in this JS file, the user is bound to 3973. Now, if, you, if I reload the page, you'll watch it. It'll grab another session. Okay, so now we can monitor multiple users at the same time. So we can grab in, jump in there. Okay. Now we're watching 9732. Now, JavaScript on the fly, we'll just make it very simple. Alert document.cookie. We will be real quick and we'll wait a second. We'll go to the users. So what we're going to do is command the browser. Okay, so save. and it executed in their environment, okay? So now we got persistent control, bi-directional communication using JavaScript. Think of it as kind of like a JavaScript Trojan horse, okay, without the, an install process, okay? So in, my, in the code here, so we can really do whatever it is that we want. want. So if uh, we'll pull up, uh, anybody know some cool JavaScript? <laughs> Now, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Don't want to open my mail client. Oh. So we can, let's see, what, what commands do we want to send? I'm not sure I have this all pre made. So, how about. Var HTML equals now. Hmm. You want to send cool JavaScript to the browser? Yeah. When I frame source equals C. Gotcha. Let's try this. Watched dot content window. How about dot href? Mouse is acting up now too. Equals how about one two seven dot zero dot zero dot one, and how about uh, colon seven thousand? We'll just send them right there. See if that works. Come on. Why are you not working? <laughs> Should work. It's trying to connect. What do you want to try to do? But, well, case in point is we have, so we have persistent bi-directional control. Any commands, any JavaScript we want to send to the browser now, we have a channel to do so. So they're perpetually in this environment. So let's try, let's click over here back to phishing with Superbait. We'll update here. Now if we want to make them go to here, copy link location. Let's try that. Throw that in there. Maybe that'll work. Looks like it's trying to connect, doesn't it? For some reason, it's not going. What the 
like what's going on. Jeez. Oh, so I told you live demos are the you know, curse. Anyway, so, so we, now we have the, this JavaScript uh, aware environment here. And uh, so we have total control. Now, is there a real world example on why you would want to control the, the user's browser other than irritation that I'm sitting there and all of a sudden the alert pops up or I get redirected somewhere? I think that's more just a matter of creativity, really. So uh, if you cross site script them and they happen to be well on their blog site, so we can walk them through using an invisible iframe, we can walk them through a change password process or a blog entry process. If they happen to be on a bank, we can make them transfer funds. And you know what the interesting part is? Every log in the world would say that they did. I mean, there's no, there's no trail. Every log in the world, the request originated from their browser, from their account. It was not stolen. I don't have their password. It, they did it. I mean, we can get really nefarious. We can make them do illegal acts. We can make them hack other websites. We can make them download child porn. We, can, we have complete control over that browser environment until, well, until they close the window. So. In the URL, yeah, you, the, the, the victim website's logs would have the, the data where you sent it to, but that might be just some kind of, you know, think, uh, you know, GeoCities or something like that. It's just a spot to put files and such, you know, so they would have that data and, they, and a place to go to. That's right. Is there anything keeping you from doing this over post? Over post? I mean, getting somebody to click on a post and then doing it that way? Oh yeah, you can make them send any request you want in any way you want. It, it might, you know, depending on the browser, it might alert. But yeah. oh, go ahead. So that whole session, as long as that browser window stays open, even if I go up to the address bar and type something different, I'm stuck in that iframe. At that point, if you manually changed it, you would uh, you would break out. You would break out. Yeah. The same would be true if I right click and said open up, spawn a new window. If you spawn a new tab, that tab would not be in control. That's right. Or or, or an entire new now entire new browser. Uh, yes, but uh, depending on the domain where that's in, they could control if it's in the same domain or something like that. So if you went right click, open a new tab, I think you'd be able to control that tab if provided it was in the same domain. So, so as long as you stay within the same DOM, they'd be able to control the second uh, the Other windows, other tabs, other whatever, yeah. It's just, it's just JavaScript. I'm not exploiting any browser vulnerabilities. It's just working as expected. As far as the browser's concerned, that data came from the website. So there's no vulnerability here other than the cross-site scripting hole. There's no OS hole, IE hole, or whatever. It's just the way it works. I'm, I'm sorry? Right, yeah, that is, you know, what are all, all web application securities breaks down to is improper input validation, you know. Yes, I'll, I'll get to that one actually. There, there are tips and tricks you can do for your website to help your users. But the real problem with cross-site scripting, you know, I'm a user just as much as everybody else is, is that cross-site scripting, we, we tout the solution is to fix cross-site scripting on the server. But that means you're putting me as a user in a position where I have to depend on the security of a website to protect me. You know, there's no client-side security for any of this. There's nothing I can do, you know, other than eyeball a link, you know, and, you know, I might be able to do it I could do this stuff, but, you know, the Joe user's not going to be able to do that. They're just going to see a link with a bunch of crazy characters in it and it looks like every other link. All right. So, we'll blaze through the, some of this so we can see some of the technical background for how this works. All right. So, what happens is the JavaScript will scrub the current DOM, overlay an iframe over the entire viewport, and fill that frame uh, with the content what the user was expected to uh, receive. I put in some code in there. I just disabled it for the talk to do keystroke capturing. We can capture keyboard events for whatever the user does, and we can pass those off domain too, just like every other uh, piece of data. And the way that bi-directional communication works is 
the JavaScript will create new, job, uh, new script tag DOM objects and keep pulling to the off-domain server going, I need a, you know, you know, source equals, and, and it'll make a source. So when we write to that file, it'll automatically get sucked into the, uh, into the user's DOM. So the trickiest part was, uh, was actually getting massive amounts of data, lots of HTML, off domain. I mean, you can do it with simple cookie strings. I mean, it's not that much data, but when you're talking about you know, an 8,000 byte web page, it gets a little bit more uh, trickier. So this is the code here. I won't go through it all, but this is the code here that monitors the iframe. So when it changes, we know. Okay, so that's the code that does that. All right, so data capturing. So, oops. So more code on how we grab data. So we capture keystrokes. We can gather up cookies in HTML. We saw that on the console. We had the cookie in there. And then what we do here is we, we take, all the I take all the data uh, and I chunk it up. And I think I use 2,000 byte blocks or 5,000 byte blocks, whatever will reasonably fit in a URL. And I chunk it up, Base64 it, and send it off domain. That's what you saw in the logs is big chunks of Base64 HTML content. And I put it all back together on the uh, website to display it. So we, get, we can track all the movements. So this it just explains more of that. So um, you know, this is the, the control server I'm using. It was just a quick web server uh, written in Perl. And it's just blasting off chunks of, uh, chunks of web pages off, off domain. So we have bidirectional communication. We've seen this. It bypasses the majority of the same origin policy. So the same origin policy says I shouldn't be able to read cross domain or send off domain. Clearly we can. Um, what the only part, well, the only part we haven't been able to circumvent with JavaScript in the same origin policy is we can send a request to any location off domain. We just can't read it back. Okay, so we can execute functions on any server. We just can't read the data. So that's really the only protection we have on the same origin policy right now. Okay, that same feature also prevents us from, uh, you know, utilizing web service and stuff out of the browser. But that's a completely different topic. But we do have bidirectional communication with the server for commands. So, what have, what have we done? I mean, it's, uh, it's neat to look at. It's uh, fun to play with. And uh, it's good for inner office jokes and things like that. But, well, clearly SSL isn't going to stop this. We've seen two-factor auth. We're interacting with the website. You know, they're going to ask you for token, username and password token. We're on the real website, so that's still going to work. We're still going to be able to track it. Um, for those of you who read the news on, my, on uh, Bank of America's use with SiteKey on, you know, the images, it's still going to work. It's still the real, rep, real website. And uh, so there's not a whole lot we can do except kill cross-site scripting to uh, prevent this. Uh, how am I doing on time? What do, what do I have? Quarter to six, so I got 15 minutes. Okay, so we'll leave up. We'll leave about five, 10 minutes for questions and such. So, these, this is the uh, the common stuff we go over. How do you fix cross-site scripting? I was blast through this. It's uh, really easy. It takes two lines of code. The the data I send in there, it'll be less than and greater than signs nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100. If you simply scrub these characters and HTML and code them. Before they're echoed back to the screen, you will not be vulnerable to cross-site scripting. The code will take you two lines if implemented properly, or maybe even one line if you're a better regexer than I am. So here's some code snippets for the Perlers like me and the PHPers unlike me. Um, so here's some code snippets for you to use and uh, improve upon if you like. This is how you fix cross-site scripting. The regex here on the top takes the data, pulls out all the nefarious characters, and encodes them with the, their proper HTML encoding. Um, these are more, the, the Perl ones are more blanket. They'll take out just about everything that's a uh, high order ASCII. All right, so what else do we have besides uh, in the code? We have uh, on the Apache side of the house, we have mod security, which does have facilities to prevent uh, less than and greater than signs in, uh, provided by the, uh, the sec filter at the uh, bottom there, prevent cross site scripting attacks. It will prevent or stop less than and greater than signs from being passed through on the I believe the query line, or the URL line. The problem is sometimes web applications have a need for allowing those characters, so this gets to be problematic. Um, it's one of the, you know, one of the, some, sometimes one of the problems with application firewalls in general. But if, you're, if your site is not supposed to be receiving those types of characters on the, um, 
the URL line. It's a good filter. You turn it on, and it does a lot of good. On the Microsoft IIS side, and you know, again, I, you know, we've uh, we've probably done a hundred websites in the last, you know, three four months, and we've noticed a lot of IIS six stuff. And I got to say, you know. I've never been a huge fan of the Microsoft products or company for that matter, but the .NET stuff, IIS 6, it's really good. We find a lot of, uh, we don't find as many vulnerabilities in that system, like cross-site scripting and SQL injection as we do on other systems, because the default configs prevent the single quotes, the semicolons, the less than and greater than signs by default. We find vulnerabilities in those systems, like I said, where they become problematic and they turn off that config for func func website functionality reasons. So IIS has that stuff built in. If you can keep those configs uh, turned on, by all means do so. Um, if you're not running IIS 6, there's also IIS Lockdown, URL Scan, and Secure IIS by EI, and those will all uh, help you prevent this problem. They all have facilities to prevent cross-site scripting and SQL injection. Now, to the gentleman's question about uh, frame busting code. Now, this was normally used to prevent abuse for, from people encapsulating websites in frames. But I found that the uh, that this is a, actually a really good technique to prevent the uh, the uh, well, the phishing with superbait hacks, the one where I encapsulate the iframe, is that this code here will actually uh, make the web page explode out of the internal iframe and come full screen. Okay, I've actually not been able to figure out a way to if that code is actually in the originating web page. I haven't been able to get, figure out a good way to stop that behavior from happening. It doesn't hurt a web page to put that in there. You just slide that one liner in there, and it's a lot safer. It's, it's, a, it's a bitch to get around, believe me. And that's it. All right. Um, thank you very much. Questions? <laughs> There's lots of ideas out there. Uh, I could probably bend your ear for an hour, but there has been ideas, but nobody takes the problem seriously enough to do anything about it, really. So, but it could, you know, it's either it's one of two people got to do something about it, Microsoft or Firefox. I could pr program a, some kind of module, but no one's going to use it. So. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you, everybody.